Today event is a VB Extra, and there we have Thomas Zubrickin, who's going to give us an update on the activities and plans for space science. He's the AA for Science Mission Directorate at headquarters. One of those folks that works seamlessly. Thank you. So the good news is that you had amazing introductions. So there's a number of uh, things that I was going to talk about here that uh, were already mentioned and were mentioned better than I uh, wanted to mention them here. Uh, I want to start with two stories. The first one is uh, related, and, and of course, the essence of the talk is all about workforce and uh, what it takes to do the, the mission at hand. Uh, the first story is that I was a part of a meeting uh, somewhere at headquarters, and we were talking about risks of certain systems. And when we did that, uh, we used data. And some of the data I recognized, uh, the data, in fact, uh, came from missions uh, uh, such as these. Missions that have flown in the last few years, uh, missions that were developed with people that I knew uh, or uh, people that I had known uh, before they uh, retired and so forth. Uh, what the challenge was of the discussion we had was, however, that the risk was based on a program that we celebrated this year, a program that's 50 years old, and for which I didn't know a single person anymore from the perspective of who was at work and who actually knew that. Now, what I learned from these missions, and I don't want to talk about them, is that if you actually want to assess risk, uh, another word that people talk about a lot is the opposite of risk they think is heritage. If you want to assess heritage, um, uh, many people think that that relates to some document in some shelf or a uh, document in a folder, uh, for those of us who use computers more, um, that basically says this is how you do this. Uh, well, that's not what we're learning. Uh, there's many documents that describe any one of those mechanisms, any one of those software uh, tools, any one of those uh, enabling, mission enabling characteristics that have been written that people teach in schools. I used to teach in schools and they have almost nothing to do with the reality of doing it because what's actually the hard part is that part that is the art of building space systems and that art resides in people. That art resides in both managers, engineers and technicians at the level that, uh, frankly, only real work, actually hands-on work will get you. That, colleagues, is the hardest part of uh, kind of in many ways talking about Artemis. It's the hardest part of talking about the future because, of course, we are a proud agency. We're a pro proud community with our commercial partners. We're a proud international set of partners uh, that want to do uh, work and have, of course, established a record of doing these missions and many in the human exploration realm and the space tech realm. But we have not done what we want to do for a long, long time. And so for me, uh, I think that's what we can learn, my opinion, from science in so many ways, because we do this, uh, if you added up those numbers, it's 105 of them. Let me talk about one of them. Uh, one of them uh, that we're really excited about is this Dragonfly mission. Uh, anybody who looks at this kind of flying vehicle dropped in the uh, atmosphere of Titan and flying around immediately recognizes this is not a low-risk mission uh, because uh, there's a lot of things about the atmosphere, about uh, flying, about the uh, instruments that are on there that are anything but easy. How do we know that we can do this? First of all, we did spend a lot of time actually looking at every one of those technologies, any one of the technical risks that an independent panel found, independent views are absolutely essential, in other words, to actually do this. I mean, that's why I'm so excited about what the general talked about uh, and, and others before that we need the independent views to actually establish what the questions are that we haven't asked yet. Not because they're not important, we haven't thought of them yet. So that's issue one. The other reason that we're comfortable selecting this mission after not because we're group thinking in the room and unaware of the fact that this is risky, is that the team that did this previously 
as a previous uh, uh, mission, push solar, Parker Solar Probe over the finish line, not only as a technical success, but within cost and schedule. So for me, that's what heritage means. Now, of course, uh, Parker Solar Probe and this are different missions, but make no mistake, there's a lot of uh, mission enabling technologies and kind of avionics and other type of uh, elements of a Parker Solar Probe that in everywhere are harder than what this one is. So the question is, can uh, this team do it? The answer is not. I, it's not because I, I believed in some kind of pitch that we teach in business schools and everybody tears up a little bit and puts money on the table. It's, it's the question is, can we, actually, can we actually do it because of what we've seen? And so that's uh, how we want to uh, grow forward. By the way, that's exactly uh, what we want to do as we go to the moon. The science uh, that we want to do, of course, had had a major pivot point uh, from the Apollo era uh, with uh, the moon being recognized, of course, I really discovered as a body that carries the history uh, of the Earth and the whole solar system, but uh, a body that's geologically active uh, to one that actually has water. Uh, water, of course, being important all by itself, uh, because uh, whenever we talk about uh, a kind of relationship to the physical, the chemical world, to the biological world, water always plays an important role. And trust me, in my PhD is in 96. Uh, the only thing, 95 is kind of where the pivot point was, but the only thing we talked about that had water primarily is the Earth. After that, there's an avalanche of papers that felt talking about the moon, talking about Mars, talking about Europa, talking about and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. And uh, in fact, uh, you saw the press release two days ago that I talked about yet another mini Neptune somewhere with water vapor for the first time discovered there. Is that proof of life? Oh, no, 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 no. Absolutely not. Many Neptunes don't have solid surfaces, most certainly, and they're so hot that underneath the atmosphere, uh, very likely uh, life will perish of the type we know, kind of based on complex molecules. But it's a major milestone on that ladder uh, towards life that, that we're doing. So uh, that pivot point uh, from uh, the uh, uh, at Relspit to the moon, of course, happened with uh, Professor Peter, Peters at uh, Carly Peters at, uh, at Brown and uh, the work that happened afterwards. Of course, once you know how to look at nature, and that's really important uh, also, once you know what the questions are you need to ask, all of a sudden you find in your old samples, samples that these uh, astronauts, like, such as the ones on your panel and others, uh, uh, on the users group and others, uh, brought back. Some of these samples have uh, secrets in them and discoveries in them that we're still now finding, such as, hey, in some of these grains, there's actually water on the inside. So we had it in our labs all along. And of course, didn't know how to ask the question, because as you know, science of tomorrow is crazy today. So especially the good science. So, so as we always flirt with the boundary of crazy, so I apologize when we come across that way. So, so, so that's what good scientists do. Okay, so, uh, so that's, uh, that's where we're going. So, when we look at now uh, the function of uh, science, what we want to do, of course, it's focused on uh, questions uh, such as uh, recognizing that, again, the moon is not some kind of thing. Yeah, the moon that your grandparents looked at from the Earth looks pretty much the same as the moon that you looked at. Well, the moon that we look at with our data looks different than the moon during the Apollo era because, for example, there's a lot more craters that were not there indicating that the solar system, of course, the accretion process of the solar system is still in some ways going on. Not the early stage that led to planets, but there's a lot of rocks around. By the way, discoveries that we're making with Parker's solar probe, and we're going to talk about that once these nature papers and so forth are coming out. This whole solar system is tied together. The moon as a canvas is showing us uh, what's happening right in our environment relative to these rocks, rocks, of course, that threaten us. So we have science goals that we want to address. I was asked to talk about these science goals, and some of them were already uh, talked about. Now, the way I think about CLIPS, and I, I, I just want to uh, now tell you the second story. I told you I'll tell you two. The second story is uh, just like you, those of us who are geeks, like the moment I started taking this job, I've watched every launch, no matter what time, because I know every launch changes my life if it's not working, whether it's the Europeans, you know, uh, with an Ariane, uh, because, of course, I think of web 
uh, if it's, uh, if it's uh, you know, uh, any one of our commercial partners here, kind of that have launched their launch, have launched every landing. And if there's anything we learned, it's a lot harder to land on the moon than people thought. Uh, by the way, this is not because those people are not good. Uh, we know these people. I mean, uh, we have other respect. And just like everybody up here, we think that the landings that did not work uh, do not relate to failures of those missions. But for me, uh, what I did, uh, as I sat in this case, actually uh, was on a plane as I saw the data coming in, the unfortunate data in the most recent event uh, with our Indian colleagues. What I did is, in, in fact, sent that very email that you implied, right, and said, Steve, I want to have a discussion. And, you know, it's not one of those things where we force people, but I want to have us come together and basically learn from each other. First of all, the only people that have landed, the way I talk about heritage, that with heritage have landed on planetary surfaces are in science. Uh, we've done so on a bunch of bodies uh, uh, with a bunch of institutions, including Mars, which is a lot harder uh, for many reasons than the moon and others. Uh, there's an important uh, landing experience elsewhere. Uh, you know, we all, of course, with, in all look at these uh, uh, rockets coming back from SpaceX and landing upright like a, you know, like a, a pencil upright. It's like, how do you do that? That's amazing, right? So, uh, so, so there are landing experience in there. Well, let's go talk about this and actually do figure out how we, it, I mean, to me, one of the most ingenious inventions in, in aeronautics is that, is that reporting mechanisms. I, I, I mean, my opinion, it's, I mean, something that our hospitals yet have to learn, you know, that, that in many ways, uh, you know, that system has done well. So how do we build that? Uh, so often, what we think about with CLIPS, of course, we're walking on the bridge we're building right now. Uh, by the way, that is uh, what we want to do because what CLIPS is, and I'm not going to talk about this chart, others have. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, there's two functions for CLIPS, uh, and, and that's what you always have to remember. Uh, the first one is it's an innovation portfolio uh, tool. So it's really, for us, it's not about being in line, uh, kind of in a direct fashion to 24 from the beginning that we never wanted to do that. If we're in line, the very flexibility that actually benefits, that kind of uh, adds value, the type of stuff that we see here on stage in the earlier panel, that comes from the fact that we're not in line uh, within 24. The moment you put us in line, I have to tighten things up. And so what I have to do is make risk assessments in a way that actually kind of in many ways gets the baby out of, with the bad water, right? So that, not going to do that. I want to talk to you what that means, that innovation portfolio. Um, it means that if you looked at it, all the numbers up that uh, Jay and others talked about, there's something like 28 investments. Yes, there's science, but it was mentioned there's technology investments and things that are relevant to human exploration that are also part of these payloads. These 28 investments for technologies are being developed because of its prom the promise of flying them to the surface of the moon. The way we're developing them is not like I do an instrument that goes to the surface of Mars, where an instrument is the cost of a, a small mission, $100 million, $80 million. We're matching the risk and the cost in a way that allows us to iterate faster so a loss could be explained to a taxpayer. Right? We cannot explain to a taxpayer if we, if we do it for a first shot where we know the risk is high, we put billions of dollars into the surface. Cannot explain that, my opinion. I don't know how. I don't know. I actually try those things. I actually sit next to taxpayers and they probably hate me because they're sitting to me on the plane. It's like, how can I get to a different seat? Anyway. <laughs> but try it. But I, I actually really believe that that's a criteria we should have. So we don't want to use these expensive payloads that we have, but we want to innovate. Because even if the answer, even if we don't, just like we talk about the Indian and the Israeli lander to be a success in many ways, uh, uh, these will be success because of the fact that they give us an inventory of new technologies that we deploy forward in a way that uh, the good panel members uh, talked about. The second benefit, of course, is the one that was already mentioned, which is, uh, which is the science benefit. So I'm going to uh, talk about, uh, I won't focus on that anymore. We talked about these partners and uh, how they're thinking. We talked about these technologies. Uh, one of the important things about these technologies is what's in the last, the last words there. They're in many districts. 
and in many different locations that, that, uh, that, kind of, that are starting to benefit and, and we're excited about this because some of these technologies are really cool. Like look at this one uh, by Honeybee, a technology that will be supporting a human exploration kind of uh, activity with a novel uh, way of acquiring samples kind of uh, over and above, of course, what we've seen uh, the last time we were at the uh, surface. Uh, of the moon or, or seismology instruments that, uh, of course, we have some that are on uh, sophisticated ones that are on Mars right now. Well, the, the version for the moon we're developing right now there in, at Texas Tech, uh, you know, at, uh, with partners that are coming to the table, partners that will enrich not only that investigation, but investigations throughout the entire solar system. But uh, with that, give us tools that can allow us to do science, some of the science that I just talked about, that high priority uh, for all of us. So uh, again, um, that's how we think about the nature of going forward. Uh, we look at both the science that is there as a, in, from an innovation portfolio sense, the science that we can address, but we also think of the samples that are there. Sample science, in many ways, is some of the most undervalued science. I think if we sat here in 20 years and we said, what's the most important science? I would argue that some of these sample signs, whether it's from our sample return, whether it's from uh, the samples that we're going to get through this campaign, will be transformative. Again, because they enable us to ask questions that we don't have to yet know when we sample, uh, like I, I made earlier, uh, the point I made earlier. So what do I think about uh, from the point of view of workforce? And that's kind of at the essence of, of this talk. Um, first of all, uh, those of you who have built hardware recognize that there's really good people, very good innovators, but the people that are successful are the ones that can build excellent teams. Uh, it's kind of a hard lesson to learn. It's a very humbling lesson, and I'm not going to bore you with my story uh, just to tell you kind of the last time you sat on a Christmas Eve next to a technician that had to work during Christmas Eve because you screwed up uh, in planning. And of course, I'm there because you don't let the guy work and you're at home. But you, the last time you did that, you recognized that guy is just as important as you are for success. Because right that and that day, that person has to is in charge of the entire schedule of the entire uh, mission. And all these people with PhDs like me and others are not going to be the relevant people at that moment in time. And so, so basically, once you recognize that, you realize it's about teams, it's about uh, diverse opinions, the opposite of excellence is groupthink. And uh, groupthink also of very experienced people is still groupthink. And, uh, and so for me, uh, one of the benefits of frankly the bringing these commercial partners to the table is that it pushes us out of groupthink. We're asking questions that we should be asking and we're not naturally asking. And so for me, that is already a benefit that I believe in and, and I, I really, uh, for me, that is what, what makes good decisions. That's why you can take more risks. The Dragonfly uh, mission, I would never be comfortable uh, choosing in a group think type of environment. It's in an environment in which we push each other and basically get to a place where the reason we do it, and we, by the way, we start addressing risk from the moment we say yes. Not because we're blind about it, we already did. Uh, if you look carefully, we moved the mission to the right already on day one. Why? Because we thought it's harder than we thought they thought. And so we're, we're, we're working on it. Of course, we're betting on them and that, that they will be successful, but not because we blindly group think. It's because we believe in the value of these teams. And so that's really uh, critical uh, uh, to do that. And, uh, and the second one is all about leadership. I think we should worry more about excellence than we are at times. Uh, excellence does not come from kind of telling your mirror you're excellent and kind of believing that. It comes from proof points that are established in, in excellent teams to move forward. Yes, we want to create opportunities for that. That, by the way, incurs risk. If I have a, uh, a less experienced initial project manager doing a small mission, that became just a little more, more risky than one of the, what you call them, gray beards. Like somebody who's kind of, has done project management 20 times over to get to where they are in their careers. We should worry about leadership from the perspective that we actually grow it, uh, deliberately grow it. And I believe that part of the, the real opportunity of Artemis is to do just that, 
uh, to kind of push uh, that uh, development of the next generation, the excitement that we see both in government and the commercial and the academic communities to do this amazing work that really attracts talent at the level that we need to be excellent. Yes, it's about excellent teams. It's also about uh, growing this leadership. Uh, and for us, it's really the breadth that's critical. So we don't want one type of leader, one type of, uh, of team. We want uh, to see these kind of uh, mixed teams, these uh, commercial partnerships that make us better uh, leadership, both uh, in the government and commercial and the academic side towards, uh, towards excellence. That's what's on our mind. That's where we're putting our effort and that's uh, where uh, relative to uh, Artemis, relative to the lunar activities, but also beyond uh, where we're uh, putting not only our uh, time and effort, but our treasure uh, as well. So, so uh, that's uh, what I'd like to talk to you about, and I'll turn it over for questions if there are any. Test. Uh, good morning, uh, Andrew from NASA Marshall, uh, one of the local leads here for the Huntsville uh, Space Apps Challenge. Could you talk about um, Science Mission Directorate's role, your role, and the importance of the NASA International Space Apps Challenge with helping grow future leaders? Thank you. Yeah, I love, I mean, I, the first time I heard about Space Apps, I, I was in love with it right away. And I, well, people didn't know, of course, uh, uh, until just a couple of years ago, I had the record of organizing the largest hackathon. We did that, sorry, General, we did it in the big house, you know, the great university north of Ohio. It's Ohio State uh, fan over there. So, 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 uh, so we did it at the University of Michigan, invited uh, people from everywhere. And the energy in a hackathon, right, there's, there's many different types of innovation. But the energy in a hackathon, if done right, during a time of a week or so, to bring together teams and actually do something. Uh, actually create something, not, not the space mission, create something of benefit for somebody else is a really enabling and empowering, also a humbling experience at times because it's, as we say, it's harder than that. So the Space Apps Challenge, of course, is the largest uh, hackathon. It's an international one uh, where people come together from around the world. Uh, thousands uh, ten of teams, tens of thousands of teams, and then uh, interacting uh, really overall with millions of individuals from around the world. Uh, it's uh, exactly what we should be doing uh, with the NASA logo at the center uh, to really inspire and attract. It's, it's, it's not just about telling a story, it's engaging people. So what I'm excited about is, in many ways, space apps is kind of a, the lowest level of meaningful engagement. So it's a very important step of uh, uh, towards uh, the engagement that I talk about in the missions. That's why I care about it. So thanks for your work and the work of your team. There's one up here. Oh, here we go. You were just asking. Oh, there's a, there's a microphone oh. floating your way. Okay. Hi. Uh, good to see you again. Um, see you. Just wondering, you know, when I think of missions uh, such as the, uh, I'm forgetting the acronym for it, but the, the Titan probe where you're, you're flying around, fly. you've got such a light distance. You've got so many different missions where it seems like AI must be a key enabling technology because you can't steer it every step of the way. You can't have the reaction time. How is that technology, I guess, revolutionizing science in space? And, and are you finding it, well, you know, obviously a lot more money probably going into aut autonomous cars and UAVs and things like that. Is it easy to get people and the technology into NASA and into space programs at this time? So first of all, you know, for many years, decades in fact, NASA was the leader in some of those uh, technology developments. And you know, in our space tech, I think I bumped into Jim Reuter today, there's a lot of work uh, and, and also in science that is put towards that. I do believe that in many ways the autonomy discussion right now in, in some of the domains at least has changed in a way that uh, there's investments now literally at the billions of dollars uh, where, uh, you know, I remember uh, being at the university, right, kind of a, a PhD in AI, kind of in autonomy, uh, who's really good, uh, has a starting salary close to a, a million bucks now, right? I mean, my data are two years old, so it may not be, it may underestimate, overestimate, I don't know, as the, the supply becomes bigger. So, so, uh, so for us, uh, I think there's two strategies we should focus on. Uh, first one is how do we spin in the technologies that are there? So partnerships also here, 
in many ways are the solution. It's not building kind of an insular a group of, of people on the inside of the agencies to try to learn how we can, in fact, uh, you know, benefit from the work that's already there. There's a number of theorems that were proven, a number of uh, applications that are, are being used that are very much applicable uh, here. And, uh, and, and frankly, we're, we're spending effort towards uh, that. Uh, uh, the second one is to focus on the elements that will not be developed elsewhere. Again, I, I just talked about uh, landing sites, a uh, kind of landing elsewhere. I mean, kind of, uh, even though there's a lot of good that will come from, uh, you know, spinning in technologies, there's elements to that uh, that are very different. Uh, you know, for example, one of the things people forget is that you have a very important time budget on the way in, right? So if you want to do the right thing too slowly, uh, that's a bad day for you, even though you did everything right. Uh, kind of a, in a car, you can slow down, give yourself time for that. Well, you're not going to uh, on the, in, in some of these uh, kind of entry, descent, and landing type of activities to the level that you can. So it's really about learning to spin in and to develop where the niches are where we should have excellence. Yes, we want uh, our talent uh, both within the agency and kind of in our broad portfolio to benefit from that. Uh, and uh, and uh, we're, we're looking at both. Uh, the, the one thing we haven't done enough, uh, let me tell you what we're talking about right now, is actually uh, uh, Jay talked about uh, uh, the tremendous amount of data that came from the moon. Uh, of course, the data that we have from Earth with the 24 missions in orbit and so forth is, is a multi multiple of that uh, because we have so many more frequencies and so forth. So the question is, how do we actually analyze those data? And I think much of the... AI on the data analysis side, kind of the smart, the deep learning, the smart analysis uh, would really, uh, if applied the right way, uh, and there's a number of people working on it, so I'm not saying we're not, but an enhanced focus on that would actually create more societal value than uh, we currently get out of those data. So for me, that's a, a third element does not relate exactly to the missions, but in many ways are, it's just as important or even more important just because it, it, the kind of the benefit is faster uh, to society than some of the others. So thanks for the question. We have one over here. Hi, Thomas. Hey. Uh, Richard French from uh, Rocket Lab. I, I know who you are. He was my <laughs> student many years ago. <laughs> so uh, Dragonfly is a great example of a, of a you know, mainline science uh, program that's leaning forward and being more innovative. Do you see um, more opportunities across the, the science mission directorate with all the science divisions to do that? And, and, and what are they? Um, you know, just as an example, we have EVM3 coming out, I think, in about a month. Um, Earth Venture is an amazing program, but we're only on EVM3. You know, that mission won't launch until 2024. Um, so, yeah, what, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? So what we have done, kind of our commercial engagement strategy has been one in which we drive with a hypothesis and we put effort in, in which we are not betting the whole portfolio on, but we create, because of the size of the program, we create experiments in which we can actually do learning. Where learning is not, you know, you can't do it with, with a data analysis. Clips is one of them, you know. So we're driving uh, towards uh, that, uh, that kind of developing that capability, if successful, would be transformative. Like is the sustainability of, you know, um, uh, beyond 24, this will have a huge impact if successful, perhaps even before, depending on technologies. We have something like five experiments like that going on. Uh, one of them, of course, uh, is one that, uh, you know, we tend to forget. This was started long before I did, but the venture class launch vehicles is, is one of those experiments where, where Earth Science basically said, look, we have small missions that are becoming more important. We need perhaps the right size launch vehicles so we can actually uh, go faster, go quicker. And if we're successful, we can actually iterate a lot more because we don't every time bet many hundred millions of dollars on top of a rocket to, to try something. We can go faster, we can experiment. So that's a second experiment and it's still ongoing. By the way, it's looking positive. Pretty positive, but you know, we only claim success once we have, we can go buy those services on a regular basis and trust me, I have some things that I need those launch capabilities for. Uh, in, in addition to that, uh, a third experiment that, that we're working on is one focused on data buys of Earth imaging emissions. So what we're doing there is basically recognizing that there's companies, especially those with constellations of many spacecraft, they're imaging the Earth not because we told them to. 
Uh, it's because they, they're doing that based on their own business uh, uh, activities, you know, and, and interests. Uh, but once the data are in some box, and, you know, having you and I have worked on this, right, recognizing that the data decreases with value, uh, decreases, the value of the data decreases with time really rapidly. I mean, you know, like, so, so can we be an aftermarket user and, and put uh, the data out to, for the benefit of the science coming. So we're running three experiments, three experiments with three companies right now, uh, because what we're trying to learn is not so much can we, of course the companies say absolutely, and here is what it costs, and it's like, well, isn't that the value of your entire company? You know, I mean, that's where I would start. If I was in a company, I would set a high price point. What I'm trying to learn, what we're trying to learn in this experiment is how to actually price the data so the value, it kind of, again, we can explain it to the taxpayer and the company, you know, uh, the right way. So that's a third experiment. There's three, four uh, additional ones that we're working on and we're continually looking at things. Uh, some of them actually are not working. So let me just talk about one that is not working the way I expected it. Uh, we thought that many of the Earth observing um, uh, elements that are geo-focused, uh, we could basically stop by uh, building spacecraft and just uh, uh, host on commercial assets. Well, if you're a student of uh, space, you recognize that the commercial market in that segment has kind of uh, decreased somewhat for a variety of reasons. And, and so basically what happens is actually we have some payloads where we're, you know, rattling around trying to find opportunities to get them to, to, to host up there. So, so basically, where we thought the market might evolve, it did not go. That doesn't mean that it will never go there. It also doesn't mean that our investments are, are, are bad. We just have to pay more. So the benefit, you know, the science per dollar benefit is not as good as we thought it would be. But, uh, but it's not working like we thought. So, so, so that's what's going to happen in some of these. But, but that's, that's the nature of what we have. Do I wish we could do more? Yes. I mean, like you said, I wish we could, you know, turn around faster, uh, that the frequency in these kind of things are set by the total cost and the, the money that we have appropriated in a given line. Um, big round of applause for Dr. Thanks. Thanks.